Few Americans know little, if anything, about Yugoslavia. One reason is because not many people know where to find it. Actually, it's really quite simple. Just go to Italy and make a right. Yugoslavia. A popular misconception about Yugoslavia is that it is a neighboring country of the Soviet Union. In actuality, it borders seven European countries, none of them being Russia. A bigger misconception than the location, though, is the country itself. When most Americans think of Yugoslavia, this is not what comes to mind. Or this. Or this. Or even this. We often think of a bleak, dreary, Iron Curtain country, inhabited by peasants clad in nothing but bleak, dreary babushkas. Which may be the case, if this is your idea of a babushka. Swimwear. While technically the government is a form of socialism, any similarity with the Soviet Union ends there. Oh, you may get the feeling you're being watched here, but I assure you it is for a completely different reason. Citizens here are free to come and go as they please, as are tourists, who need only a passport to enter the country. And while the average worker here makes only around $5,000 a year, the cost of housing, transportation, and food allows the standard of living to be surprisingly high. Why a typical five-course dinner, including vintage Yugoslavian wine, will run about $5 a person. The country itself can best be described as the best of Europe, packed into an area about the size of Wyoming. In it, you'll find the Riviera of France, the casinos of Monte Carlo, the islands of Greece, the countryside of Great Britain, the Alps of Switzerland, and Yugoslavia's own pristine lakes. Combine these all together, and you have the favorite resort destination of millions of European tourists. country in Europe has more lakes than Yugoslavia, and each is more beautiful than the next. Lake Bled, located high up in northwest Yugoslavia, is arguably the most beautiful lake of all. For centuries, Europeans have flocked to the shores of Lake Bled to enjoy the recreational, as well as the supposed medicinal benefits of the lake. Emperor Henry II enjoyed the lake so much, in fact, he had his castle built here in the year 1004. Today, the castle is a popular tourist attraction. The people who live here say that the Slovenian goddess of love and life resides in the church on the island. And they say that if you make a wish when the bells are chiming, that it will surely come true. Let's see. They weren't kidding. One reason Yugoslavia is such a popular tourist destination is that, like Southern California, you can go from mountain peaks to sunny beaches in a matter of hours. And if you have tour drivers like ours, the trip can be made in minutes, not seconds. The Yugoslavian Riviera really isn't that much different than the French Riviera or the Italian Riviera, except that the beaches here are rocky. They're not sandy. But they do have the sidewalk cafes and shops. And as you can see, people strolling up and down Oh, yes, and of course, they do have those things that all Rivieras are famous for. The one word which transcends all language barriers is the word bikini, or even the lack of it. Europeans are known for their immodesty. In an Opatia, the Yugoslavian Riviera, a modesty is not in short supply. What is in short supply, however, are hotel rooms each summer. That is why every available room is open for lodging during the tourist season. All along the Yugoslavian Riviera, there are these beautiful old castles that were once used for kings and queens, for the nobility of Yugoslavia. Well, since there is no more nobility, they are now beautiful, quaint little hotels that are used for people like you and me. You see, there's a perfect bed for two. It's pretty romantic. And for about $30 a night per person, I'd say that's living like a king. Oh, by the way, that includes meals. <laughs> Sounds pretty noble to me.
From the beaches during the day to the casinos at night, Opatia leaves little for the tourist to desire. And yet this is but a small part of the treasures Yugoslavia has to offer. For centuries, man has tried to determine if indeed the Garden of Eden ever existed, and if it did, where? Though Yugoslavia has only been considered a remote possibility, it's hard to imagine a more ideal location than here at Putnica Lakes, one of the natural wonders of the world. The Plitvica lakes are comprised of 16 lakes, cascading into one another and ending here at the Veliki Falls. The lakes are located in central Yugoslavia, accessible only by car over hundreds of miles of mountain roads. Still, the park is filled to capacity each summer by tourists willing to brave the mountain roads for a glimpse of Mother Nature at her best. One of the most spectacular things that happens right here under the waterfalls, and one of the most romantic things I can imagine, is that every year on a certain day, couples come here from all over the world and they get married. They get a little wet, but they get married. And that happens every year on May 25th. Are you doing anything May 25th? Uh, no, 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 he's not no. doing anything May 25th. <laughs> This is the coastal city of Split, Yugoslavia's most popular summer resort. Split is a gathering place for Yugoslavia's most famous artists, like photographer here, Stephen Lupino, as well as those still on the verge of discovery. It also is the home for the State Museum of Ivan Meisterovic, Yugoslavia's most renowned sculptor and perhaps one of the finest in modern history. Split has been a cultural center for artists like Meisterovic ever since the Roman Emperor Diocletian built his palace here in 305 AD. Today, the palace still stands, but instead of one man occupying the spacious dwellings, the palace is now home to a hundred families. The cultural tradition, however, remains just as strong as it was some 1,681 years earlier. Every scenes of people from all over Europe come to the city to enjoy their annual performing arts festival. And all over the city you'll find cultural events taking place and they use ancient structures for their stages, like here, which is a Roman pedestal, where the operas are performed. Or here, where plays from Shakespeare's era are performed. And even here, where classical ballets are performed. This used to be an ancient cemetery, but today, culture lives on. home of the famous Lipizzaner stallions, recognized to some as the world's most beautiful horses. The stallions are best known as the horses which perform in Vienna's famous Spanish riding school. But to the tourists who visit Lipizza, there's simply another jewel to be found in Europe's hidden treasure. city of Sarajevo, Olympic nostalgia seems far behind. Life proceeds with old world charm and European bustle, and a few surprising Yankee touches. Hello, America. During the years of the Turkish domination, the old city was laid out so that each street represented a separate craft. Only one of these streets, the Copperworker Street, remains today. Lots of people call Sarajevo Yugoslavia in miniature. One reason is that four major religions, Islam, Judaism, Roman Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy have active congregations here. Though the Communist Party isn't enthusiastic about religion, quite a few people still practice. The city became the focus of world attention. 
There are many people who feel that World War I actually started right here. It was on this very intersection that Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated by Gabriel Princip, one of the many men who wanted freedom from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was just as Archduke Ferdinand traveled across this bridge into the intersection that he and his wife were killed. The place where Gavrilo Princip stood when he shot them is marked now, a dubious sort of shrine. The people of Sarajevo view it with ambivalence. On the one hand, it was an important first step toward Yugoslav independence. On the other hand, it was a double murder, and it led to a long and bloody war. It's Belgrade. Yeah. <laughs> Belgrade is not at all the cold, dank place we might have pictured. At night, the streets in its old Bohemian sector are closed to traffic, and a spirit of fun prevails. By day, the Yugoslavs, well, they take time to smell the roses, and evidence of their sense of humor abounds. For example, this restaurant opened for business a few hundred years ago, right here across from the church. They called themselves, naturally enough, the place across from the church but the church protested. Well, the restaurant protested back, giving itself no name at all and sporting only a question mark to identify itself. In the heart of the city of Belgrade lies a shrine that is special to most Yugoslavians. This is the tomb of Josip Broz, the man that we all know as Tito. He died in 1980 and they buried him here in the building where he had his winter garden. They call his tomb the House of Flowers because he loved flowers very much. The guard changes here every 15 minutes, and more than one million visitors pay their respects each year at the tomb, which is located on the grounds of Tito's former residence. It's a public park now, featuring works by Yugoslavian sculptors and peacocks who reportedly do their most raucous crying each year on the anniversary of Tito's death. In the small town of Mostar, a Turkish architect left behind a lasting legacy, this lovely bridge. It's leaving dangerous shoes. It is the town's centerpiece now, complete with divers who plunge 88 feet into 13 feet of water. But when it was unveiled in 1566, the architect left town forever because he was afraid the bridge would fall down. Of course, he couldn't have been more wrong. And I also found that you meet the most interesting people on the Mostar Bridge. I'm a child of uh, Yugoslav parents. And they met in the States, they got married in the States. I was born in the States, in Santa Monica, in St. John's Hospital. Oh, gosh. And uh, after living there, my parents divorced, and my mother decided that uh, she would be better off to return to Yugoslavia, to her family. Here in Yugoslavia, life in particular is, is different. It's uh, more uh, easygoing. There's no pressure. It's, uh, maybe I can say it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's easier to live here than in the States. What kind of pressures do you think you have in the States that you don't have here? Well, I haven't worked in the States. Well, actually, in 1979, when I was uh, the last time in the States, in Redondo Beach, I uh, worked at Foster's Freeze for about two months on PCH. So uh, uh, people work more there in the States. That's what I've seen in 1979. While here, I can't say that they don't work enough, but uh, they work, but it's an easy-going way. I don't think that uh, you have much strains, as many strains as maybe somebody has in America. Life is more important here than work. Yes, yes. In the United States, work seems to be more important yes. than life. Tell me about Mostar, what you love about Mostar. What I mostly love about Mostar is uh, this bridge, the old part of the town, the river. I go swimming under the bridge here almost uh, every other day in the summer. Come down here and uh, refresh myself, cool off, because here in Mostar it gets very, very hot. Oh, Come here. God. That's creeping. Oh, my. Oh. oh, that's just unbelievably cold. 
By the way, Wesley Bosnich, the man who loves to swim in freezing rivers, moved from California to Yugoslavia when he was 10 years old. He's now 26 and studying English literature. I'm not going in that water! That is like ice! He'll marry his Yugoslavian sweetheart next year, and they plan to make Mostar their home. Just south of Dubrovnik is a land of proud people and pure water. Its scenery is naturally spectacular, and its villages hold ancient secrets. Its beaches are wide, its seclusion seductive, and its mountains steep and black. It is the land of Montenegro. who was born in Montenegro, and I'm sure you can tell from looking at him, that one of the things Montenegro is famous for is they're very good-looking men. And love and romance. And love and romance. They're also famous as being great warriors. And love and romance. And love and romance. I have to finish my lines. Wait a minute. And Montenegro has a very proud history. And, and love, love and, and romance. romance. <laughs> In the long history of Montenegro, it has never once been totally conquered. But at the end of World War I, they united with five other Slavic states to form the land of the South Slavs, Yugoslavia. The story of Sveti Stefan reads like a fairy tale. In the 15th century, a clan of brave Montenegrin warriors did battle with pirates. They overcame the pirates, took their treasure, and they decided to show their gratitude by building this church. They called it St. Stephen, or Sveti Stefan, which, if you haven't guessed already, is how the island got its name. And 500 years later, you can still go to church here on Sundays. The Montenegrin clan established themselves here on the island because a walled city on an island was easy to defend. As the population grew, since building space was at a premium, the narrow little streets took quirky turns around intriguing corners, and Sveti Stefan developed an architectural style that is unique. After World War II, there were only five families left on the island of Sveti Stefan, and the government relocated them to the mainland. And it was then that Tito decided to build a one-of-a-kind hotel. What makes this hotel unique is that you are actually checking into an island, complete with pool and restaurants. By American standards, it's not outrageously expensive, ranging in price from $60 to $150 a night. And instead of just getting a room, you get a piece of history by staying in one of the original cottages of the Montenegrin clan. The result is a charmed little circle. It's like checking into a storybook. And I feel a little like Snow White or Cinderella, and that if I closed my eyes, maybe Prince Charming would appear. Ah, good choice. <laughs> here's to you, Prince. And here's to Sveti Stefan and Montenegro. In the early morning on the peaceful blue Adriatic Sea, this city shimmers. It exudes an air of self-confidence and seems to say, look at me from any angle. Stand as far away as you like or come as close as you can. You will still find me beautiful. It is a cocky, charming city. It challenges us. It has panache. It says, go ahead. You can even look at the men sleeping on my park benches. They are beautiful, too. My old women are beautiful. And so are my young women. My men are stalwart, and their hair turns an early gray. 
My children are spirited. My buildings are adorned with style. I am a city that is smart and relaxed and pleased with itself. I am... Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik. Welcome to Dubrovnik. I think that this is one of the most beautiful, charming, and unique cities in the entire world. And I can't wait to show you around. Now, pigeons are probably not the thing you thought I'd show you first. But in Dubrovnik, believe it or not, even the pigeons have personality. And they're also very set in their ways. Every day at noon, the pigeons are fed by Vidor. Look at them all. And for years, this has been going on. And the pigeons come every day at noon, and they wait for Vidor to feed them. And when the country goes to daylight savings time, the pigeons get here an hour early. They really do. And it takes them about two weeks to adjust. Oh my gosh, I feel like uh, Tippi Hedren and the birds. Thank you, Vidor. Thank you very much. That's my earring. Oh, pigeon feather in my hair. Oh, that, I'm glad it's only a feather. OK, we're okay. going now. Bye. Both the pigeons and 5,000 people live inside the walls of the old city of Dubrovnik. These walls have never once been breached by an enemy, even though Dubrovnik has been ruled by several different empires. That's because the people of Dubrovnik have a talent for diplomacy, and this ability to compromise has lasted right up to the present day. Even today, the people restaurants and restaurant owners, well, they know how important tourism is. And so the private citizens and the restaurant owners reached a compromise. This is some compromise. Starting at 11 in the morning, on into the night, one side of the street has to remain clear for the pedestrians and for the people who live here. And the other side is for the sidewalk cafes that the tourists love so much. Back in the 12th century, tourists were not an issue. Friendly neighbors were. There were actually two cities here, Dubrovnik on the mainland and Ragusa, ensconced on an island just offshore. Originally, this street was an ocean channel that separated Dubrovnik from Ragusa. But as you can see, it eventually filled in, and they became one city. Once the main street was in place in the year 1205, Dubrovnik took on the aspect of a well-laid-out planned community. Even though its perpendicular streets show lots of forethought, there are still plenty of interesting nooks and corners. Throughout the old city of Dubrovnik, there are all kinds of doors. They lead into houses, to shops, to restaurants. Now here's a door, and I bet you can't guess what it leads to. Come on, let's go see. See, I didn't think you'd guess. It's a beach, a little rocky, and it's pretty rough out there today, but I think it's pretty romantic. And this is where all the kids who live in Dubrovnik learn how to swim. Even though the water is deep and there are no lifeguards, they say the kids are protected by St. Blaise, the patron saint of Dubrovnik, who keeps watch on the city walls. St. Blaise has been good to Dubrovnik in other ways, too. He seems to have given his patrons a large dose of social enlightenment. In 1416, the city abolished slavery, and in 1347, near the Cypress Grove, they established a home for the elderly, which is still located on this same spot today. The compassion of the people of Dubrovnik was matched only by their cleverness. Inside the city walls, they built a granary with an advanced storage system to give them grain for a year in case of siege. And even by the year of 1438, they had a permanent water supply. Just outside the walls, they established a lazaretto where visitors were quarantined before they entered the city. In 1317, the Franciscans opened up one of the first pharmacies in Europe, right here in their cloister. It was so successful that it is still in operation today. Imagine that, a pharmacy that has been open for almost 700 years. 
Our guide in Dubrovnik was Pava Brylo, who had also guided Prince Charles when he came on tour. She was born in Dubrovnik, and so were her children, and she's naturally a Dubrovnik partisan. What is it about Dubrovnik that is so wonderful? We all keep it in our hearts. Um, it's part of our tradition, and we are proud of its rich history, of its uh, very smart and uh, intelligent people. Most of uh, the people are embarrassed. When they come for the first time, they touch the stone, and they think it's just an uh, illusion, that it's not, that's artificial. But it, when they come to realize that it's a real living city with all its people, it, its life, they are just very, very happy. When we first learned Two on the Town was to visit Yugoslavia, we didn't know quite what to expect. Would it be like our trip to the Soviet Union, or would it be more like Greece? What would the country look like? What kind of people lived here? And would they welcome us, even though we were Americans? Well, after only a few short days here, we found the answers to our questions. Yugoslavia was like neither the Soviet Union nor Greece. It was a country quite unlike any we had ever seen on Two on the Town. And because so few Americans visit here, the rare American tourist is seen as a precious commodity, and we were treated as such. And we thought the Yugoslavian people were wonderful too. As for what the people look like, well, I think we've given you a rough idea. As most of you know, I have traveled all over the world on Two on the Town, and I considered myself pretty knowledgeable about our world. Well, I can't believe that I was so misinformed about the country of Yugoslavia. It's spectacular. And I think most of us have the misconception that it's dull and gray, and certainly not a place we'd want to take a vacation. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. Although it is a communist country, tourists are free to do just about anything they want to especially eat. I have gained four pounds already, and it hardly cost me anything. And one of the best ways to get to know people is to travel with them. And we have been traveling with three Yugoslavian guides for the past two weeks. And I can honestly say that they are people that I would like to have as friends. And the best recommendation is that our entire crew would like someday to come back to Yugoslavia for a vacation. I think that we have discovered a hidden treasure and thank you for discovering it with me.